Good afternoon and welcome to the Burwell School Historic Site. I am Janie Morris. I'm co-chair of the Burwell Research Committee and I'm one of the commissioners, Burwell School Commissioners. First, I'm going to give you just a little bit of history about the Burwell School Historic Site. The site is the property of the Historic Hillsborough Commission, or the HHC. The Historic Hillsborough Commission is a nonprofit organization established by the North Carolina General Assembly in 1963. The commission obtained the Burwell School property in 1965 restored the existing buildings and opened them to the public as a historic site. This year, we're celebrating the 60th anniversary of the Historic Hillsborough Commission. The commission members or commissioners are appointed by the North Carolina government. For 20 years, from 1837 until 1857, Burwell was a school for approximately 200 young white women and run and managed by Reverend Robert Burwell and his wife, Margaret Anna Burwell. Over the years and since the opening to the public, a tremendous amount of research has gone into compiling information about the lives of the young women who attended school. Based in, in part, uh, on the diaries and the letters of Margaret Anna Burwell. This research was spearheaded by Dr. Mary Claire Engstrom, without whom this, this site, the Burwell School Historic Site, would definitely not exist. The research resulted in the work, The Book of Burwell Students, published in 2007. And since the publication of the book, many members of the research committee over the years have continued to research the students. Not all of the students are found in the book of Burwell students, and we have been able to discover more. In addition to research about the students, in 2018, a study was undertaken to learn more about the enslaved and free people who worked at the school. In 2019, the work, Antebellum, this is a long title, Antebellum Hillsborough, Slavery, an Enslaved and Free People of Color who Worked at the Burwell School, 1837 to 1857, was published. There are some handouts that you should have that shows you how you can get to uh, some of this material. And for the last few months, several members of the research committee have been researching the lives of some of the Burwell students. Uh, of Burwell teachers, which brings me to our pro, finally brings me uh, to the program for today, and we're really in for a treat. Uh, it is a pleasure to introduce to you our two presenters, Bill Harris and Betty Eidner. Bill is a relative newcomer to the commission, but one would know it by all of the work he has done for the research committee. He's always willing to help out, volunteer for committee projects, and bring valuable insights to committee discussions. In addition to the research he has done about Frederick, Ernest Zerlock, I may be murdering the name, whom he will be discussing today, he also took the lead in finding material to go into the exhibit origins, the early years of the historic Hillsborough Commission, which used to be in the exhibit case outside in the hallway. Um, he has also been involved in other local community activities since he and his wife uh, moved to Hillsborough a few years ago, uh, retired to, to Hillsborough a few years ago. It is interesting to note that his mother-in-law was once a Burwell commission. <laughs> Well, I really can't say that Betty is a newcomer to the commission. <laughs> she has been a commissioner, chaired the commission, and many Burwell galas, uh, which is our annual fundraiser. 
and is currently a Burwell Research Committee volunteer extraordinaire. She's a crackerjack researcher and will leave no stone unturned until she has exhausted all resources about a person or topic she is researching. I have had the pleasure over the years to work with Betty and uh, two adjectives completely come to mind, amazing and awesome. <laughs> she entered, she um, retired from teaching uh, school at Orange High School several years ago. Over the years, she has been involved with many community projects and activities. Currently, she is on the board of directors of the Preservation Fund of Hillsborough and is a member of the Hillsborough Signage Committee. Those are just the ones that I know about. There may be others that I have no idea about. <laughs> she will be discussing Burwell teacher, Dr. Rudolph Vanfield today. Let's give them a warm welcome. <laughs> So that was way more than I expected. Mm -hmm. um, so let me start by saying I agree totally with one thing that Janie said. I think we're going to have a great afternoon, and I in particular am looking forward to hearing Betty talk. <laughs> They've got me batting lead off for a reason because I'm the newbie. <laughs> and uh, then the home run hitter is going to come up. And uh, for Sylvia, Dr. Uh, I just want you to know that back in high school, when I was in high school, we used to wear a lot of polyester, and that was 1970. So you can take that back to your friends and say, I went and heard a talk today, and all they wanted to talk about was what they did in high school. <laughs> okay. Uh, the second thing I have is that everything I will tell you today, a lot of things are, I do have footnotes for, I do have the sources, but as a lot of you are better researchers than I, you know that for some of these obscure historical figures, you can't find tons of information or, or answer every question that comes to mind. And I will tell you that every piece of information I found led me to like three other questions for which I couldn't find any answers. <laughs> so what I've tried to do is take the information I have and piece together a coherent story of what I think happened to this gentleman in his life. And I've just recognized at the end, I jotted down eight or nine or 10 questions that I'll let you know of things that were of interest to me, but I just couldn't find any information at all. Okay, so this guy, uh, Frederick Ernst Zerlot, he's an interesting character. He was a whole lot easier to research once we got his name right. <laughs> Originally, I was asked to uh, look for research a major Frederick E. Terlant, T-E-R-L-A-N-T. Other than the advertisement in the local papers that you know, Major Trelawne was going to be teaching at Burwell School, I couldn't find anything. I was like, this guy just doesn't exist. Our researcher, our excellence, Betty comes back, well, that's because you're looking for the wrong person. <laughs> His name is Zerlat, or Zerlat, Z-E-R-R-L-A-U-T. And when I did that, man, it was amazing, the stuff I found. So my first my first piece of advice when you're researching, make sure you know what you're researching and looking for. Okay, so this gentleman was first introduced to us in Anna Burwell's diary and on March 9th, 1855. Okay, so that prompted all of the discussion of let's see, you know, what happened with him. And I thought of a number of ways of approaching this, and I'm not really sure still yet what the best way is. So what I'm going to do is start chronologically and just work through his life and tell you what things I absolutely know and what things I think are true based off of the information I found. Because there's one place I'm going to make a huge leap and it'll still be interesting to see what you all think. Um, I did all the normal research engines. The other thing I found that's interesting is not all these research engines are created equal. Some of them had more information than others. I don't know why newspapers.com and newspapersrus.com can't have all the same stuff, but they don't. Uh, I don't understand why archives.com and the National Archives for the federal government don't have all the same information. I mean, it just, it was very frustrating to me. The two most interesting things, though, that I did in terms of my research uh, for Zerlot was, number one, 
I found that he had a connection with a school in Maryland in 1837 that we'll talk about. Couldn't find any information whatsoever on that. So I contacted the Howard, Co Howard County, Maryland uh, Research Society or Historical Society. And lo and behold, three days later, they got they gave me a whole treasure trove of information about that school and um, his relatives and people that were still living in the Maryland area. So that was very helpful. The second thing that I did that was not helpful at all, but I think is interesting, is I found him on Ancestry.com and I was able to contact his great-great-grandson um, who was very kind to say, yeah, we're really interested, but we don't know anything about this culture. <laughs> you know, if you find out anything, let us know. You know, um, so I thought that was interesting. Okay, let's start. Uh, Frederick Zerlot was born in 1807 in Strasbourg, France. Uh, he was a Polish, yes, he's Polish. But as you, if you know, if you start looking at um, European history, and I will tell you, I am not a European historian in any way, shape, or form. But I know that Strasbourg, in particular, is a city that has is straddling the French-German border and has changed changed allegiances a number of times uh, between French and German. I also know that Pol there was not a separate Poland uh, in 1807 when he was born. Between it's what 1795 and I think it was like 1817, I think or 1819 something like that. I read Poland, the Polish area was split between. Prussia, Russia, and the Habsburg Empire. So it's changed hands a number of times and kind of fluid, I guess, between the movement of the people. We don't know much about his early life other than he was born there. The next time I found any reference to him was that he was a graduate of the University of Heidelberg. I found that through an advertisement in the 1840s where he... Um, was advertised as going to be a teacher at a school in Kentucky. And it said he was a graduate of the University of Heidelberg. Now, I went and looked at the University of Heidelberg site that lists, supposedly they say, we believe that this is a comprehensive list. And he was not listed there, which, the, which probably means maybe he didn't graduate, doesn't mean he didn't study there, or maybe he came to the United States or to the colonies then and started his own career. I don't know. Do you know anything about what his parents did? No, no, nothing about his parents, nothing about his family, only, only that, okay? Um, so the next thing that happens that we found, that I found was that um, he, the first thing, the very first piece of information I found from him, other than Hillsborough, was that he showed up in the diary of John Quincy Adams, of his, John Quincy Adams' online diary. In September of 1837, he and a business partner named Charles Kratzier, and I mention that name because it's going to tie my story here, uh, he and Charles Kratzier met with John Quincy Adams about getting a reference to open a school in Ellicott City, Maryland. El Actually, then it was Ellicott Mills, Maryland, okay? So that's what led me to the Howard County discussion that I was talking to you just a few minutes ago. So he met with uh, John Quincy Adams and John Quincy Adams, let me see if I got here what I wrote down. Basically, he said, um, he said they, they wanted to meet regarding the opening of a classical school at Ellicott's Mill, Baltimore. They desired to obtain my permission to refer inquirers to me for their characters to which I readily consented, believing them to be respectable and intelligent as certainly the predicament of Polish exiles, they are very unfortunate men. Okay, so he met with him, he and Kratzer met with them. They opened the school in 1837 in Ellicott's Mill. The advertisement for the school, I've got it here, a copy um, from 1837 from the American and Commercial Daily Advertiser. Footnoting references for <laughs> uh, the list. The list of references that he has on here is extremely impressive. Um, James Fenimore Cooper, John Quincy Adams, 
uh, what's his name, uh, Pickering uh, from South Carolina, um, Thomas Pickering, um, John Calhoun. Those, those are among, he's got about 25 references on here, and those are three or four that even I, as a budding historian, looked at and go, I know that guy, I know that guy. Um, and the first thing that came to my mind is, who are these two guys? And how do they get to the United States? And how do they meet with these people? Okay, because then I found information that said they immigrated to the United States he immigrated in 1833, left out of Liverpool. He was in Liverpool, um, England, immigrated, came in through New York, and somehow ended up down in Maryland, where he opened the school. So then I got thinking, well, okay, so what's going on? All these pieces start tying together. So then I look at this Kratzier guy, I'm like, okay, so who's his business partner? So Kratzier, I found out, he ended up being a... Um, professor at the University of Virginia. He was in the Polish emigre army or the Polish uprising army in 1830, 1831, the November uprising where the Polish immigrants or the Polish uh, people rose up against Tsar Nicholas I in the 1830s. They were quickly defeated and they were offered amnesty by the Tsar, but uh, Kretzier said no, he went to France and I'm assuming, this is my first big leap, I'm assuming that because he's been referred to as Major Tur Major Turland and then Major Zerlat, I'll find several references later, that it's possible that these two young, professional, educated, college-educated men met during the uprising. I know Kratzer was in the uprising because he was awarded I forget the name of it. I've got it written down somewhere. Whatever that the uh, Polish Medal of Honor is, he was awarded the Polish Libre de Matal, whatever medal. Um, so I know he was there. And I know he declined the amnesty that was offered by Tsar Nicholas. And I'm making the leap now that um, Zerlot also was part of that revolution, given his background and everything. He went to Liverpool, coincidentally, at the same time that all of these people turning down the amnesty were. And then they both somehow immigrated to the United States, met up in New York, ended up in Maryland, and started a classical school together. And they, that school was in existence, excuse me, for about two years, about a year and a half, two years. Ran several sessions. Nice. So he... Around in 1833, what year did he print that advertisement with all this? 1837. So four years. Ago. So in four years, between 1833 and 1837, they somehow came to the United States, established themselves, gathered enough connections that they were able to meet with. Now, John Quincy Adams then, as you recall, he had been president, but after his presidency was done, he became a representative. Okay, and I believe uh, Calhoun and some of the others were also representatives. Um, but he was able to meet all of those people and establish all those connections and get their reference approval for their school. It's pretty, I mean, the first thing that came to my mind was, how do you do that? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm over 60 years old and I don't have that many contacts. <laughs> um, all right, so as we moved on, the next time that I came across him was in 1839 when he got married. He married a young lady from um, Washington, D.C. Her name was Eliza. She was 14 years his junior. He was 32 at the time. She was 18. Mm -hmm. Shortly after they were married, they moved. He left Maryland, went from Maryland to New Orleans, Louisiana. There he was credited I found a newspaper. It was the first German language newspaper uh, published in Louisiana, in New Orleans. And the editor was F.E. Zerlot. So I'm making, I'm again making assumptions, jumping from F.E. to Frederick E. Uh, but my research didn't show a whole lot of 
Sir Lot's period in the United <laughs> States at the time. So I feel pretty safe in the assumption that he moved then to New Orleans, ran this school for, or I'm sorry, ran this newspaper for about six months, eight months, and then uh, it changed names. And then it, when it was reestablished, it clearly stated Frederick E. Zerla. So uh, I'm assuming that the first guy that ran the one newspaper before the name changed was the same person since it was, you know, six months separate in the same, same city. Okay. The other thing that he did at that time was he was also described as um, having gone from, well, he's described as having gone to a conference in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I found it in Das Vaterland, which was a newspaper. I found that on the National Archives. Uh, das Vaterland had a description of this conference that took place in Pittsburgh. I didn't know it based off of the one article that it was in Pittsburgh, but I found another article later where it talked about this conference in Pittsburgh and it gave the attendees and he was the attendees and this other article talked about what was the purpose of this conference, but it didn't say it was in Pittsburgh. <laughs> so if you tie multiple pieces of information together, you get the story that he was an elected representative by the people in Maryland, the, the little area he was at to go to this conference. Their goal was to discuss what was termed German issues um, in education. So he was in, he was an educator. He had come gone from the classic school, gone to this conference, been the newspaper editor, um, just trying to tie all of these things together as to what he was doing. His role then was to go back to the um, area and establish a subcommittee to promulgate and push all of the lessons that they had from this conference to the people to uh, ensure. Now there's one thing, let me find it here. I wanna find, I wanna read this to you if I can find it. Okay. This, some of you may be able to help me with this. Those of you who have been doing this a lot longer than me. So the article that I'm referring to that talked about the um, issues was from the Lancaster, Pennsylvania Intelligencer. And it stated that he was elected to go to the conference sponsored by the Germans. The exact purpose was unknown, but it appears the delegates were, were provided instructions regarding, quote, the establishment of a pedagogical institution and liter literary society throughout the union. There was no identified political tendency but this is the part that I'd like, if any of you know anything about this, you could help me with. But they passed a resolution that delegates may, quote, induce their constituents not to elect any person to a public office who has been or is belonging to or supporting the so-called Native American society. Okay, so... My research on the Native American Society turned up zilch, not a nothing. Talking with several people, there's lots of areas that it ways that it could have gone. Did it deal with American Indians? Were the Indians already pushed out? Did it deal with, you know, enslaved people? Did it, you know, what did it what did it deal with? I don't have a clue. I couldn't find anything. All I know is that Zerlot and his cohorts didn't support them. <laughs> okay, this okay, so this would be my guess. Um, 1830s is a period of uh, great immigration from the Irish and the Germans. Yes. Both of whom were unwelcome, but they were certainly more welcome than the later immigration, which was from Southern and Eastern Europe. Uh, Irish were the most unwelcome. Germans tended to, Irish settled in cities, so they were very visible um, and didn't have any money. That's why they didn't go anyplace else. The Germans tended to have money of some sort. So they tended to go into the interior of the country, spread okay. them out. They formed their own communities, but they, there was not a lot of resentment against the Germans. But as a result of that huge push of immigration, um, native, what is called nativism mm -hmm. arose, and those are all the people who hate immigrants. 
Does that sound familiar? <laughs> um, and so the Germans would have been much less discriminated against because they had money and because they bought farms and because they were spread out. Okay. But nevertheless, you know, those who were going to the United States were very upset about this mass immigration that was coming. Thank you. What's, yeah, the, I, name? Barbie, What's the name of the group? The Native American Society. There, it, it could easily have been the name of this. Yeah, this every group. everything, all the research I did on it kept turning up Andrew Jackson's you know, pushes against the Native Americans, the Cherokee, you know, the Indians, the Cherokee. Yeah, and my guess is that, 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 that there and was, that makes perfect sense. That was we had we had discussed some of that, and those were some of the ideas that had been beaten around. Yeah, yeah. that's that's my best guess. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next thing we have on Zerlot is that in uh, November of 1840, he was naturalized to become a U.S. citizen. Uh, he did that when he was in New Orleans, and then in eight. In um, 1846, he's moved now. So remember, he, somehow he came into New York, went down to Maryland, moved over to New Orleans. Next place he's, he's going is to Cincinnati, Ohio. And he there, we find him in an advertisement for the Cincinnati Classical Academy, where he was identified as a professor of modern languages and history and an instructor of topographical drawing. Um, his... This is where it said that he got his doctorate from the University of Heidelberg, uh, working there at Cincinnati. Then in uh, 19, or I'm sorry, in 1848, he's now gone from Cincinnati and he's going across, I guess it would be across the Ohio River. He's going down to Frankfort, Kentucky, where he is now going to be appointed by the governor of Kentucky as um, to the vacant chair of modern languages at the Kentucky Military Institute. Mm -hmm. And this is the first place where we see formally for him where it says he's appointed as F.E. Zerlot Major. Mm -hmm. So now this causes me another concern that I couldn't find. I had already gone with the assumption before that he had been part of the November Uprising, mm -hmm. that he had met Kratzier, and he, that's probably how we knew each other. And that's maybe where the name, the terminology of major came from. When I saw this, I'm like, hmm. so I wonder if this means now that he wasn't a major before, or maybe he was. Now the governor's appointing him to this military school. And because of his position as a chair, he gets the title of major. Yeah. And that's another possibility. Or maybe they gave him the title of major because he had been a major before. And, you know, so this is one of the shiny examples for me of every piece of information I found opened up more questions for which I simply could find no answers, uh, some of them. After, um, well, while he was in Frankfurt at the um, Military Academy, his only child, Edmund, was born in August of 1851. Uh, as you recall, his wife was 14 years his junior, and now she's well into her 30s. He's, he's, he's what, 44? He's 44, so she's 32 uh, when they have their first and only child, Edmund. The only next time we'll see Edmund is when uh, we see his mother. They appear on the census, and her, his mother is living with him. Okay. Uh, after that, then he moves again, leaves the military academy, and now he goes to the Frankfurt High School for Young Ladies. So he's going from the military academy to the young ladies, and then from here he's going to come to Burwell. So Mrs. H.M. Brown, um, and he established this school, took over the school after the previous woman retired. And they ran four sessions of the school. Uh, that gave him the experience that he had. And that ran until 1854. They were, he was described in the Tri-Weekly Commonwealth. And it said, the major has been indef indefatigable in his efforts to improve them under his charge in the branches taught by him. And few possess so rare a combination of accomplishments that it fit him for excellence as a teacher. So he was thought of well there. 
The other thing is that he had gained such stature in Frankfurt that a traveling salesman came to town um, and Mr. Zerlot was now listed as a reference for him, for his business. And that was um, in uh, 1854, okay? And the last known involvement I have for Mr. Zerlot in Kentucky was when the Louisville Daily Courier published an advertisement saying that they had some of his goods in storage and that they were gonna sell them at auction unless he came within 30 days to collect them. But at that point, um, that was January 23rd, 1855. At that point, he was already at Burwell School. He was already in North Carolina. So the first, the first recording of him here was in 1854 on June 7th, the Hillsborough Reporter had a major Frederick Turlant, the previous wrong name, listed as a teacher for the upcoming session to teach modern languages at the all-female Burwell School. My guess is that uh, the language communication problems between English and German, something was lost in the translation. My guess is that the Burwells had never met him. Didn't They'd only had references for him and he had agreed to come here but they had never met him and didn't know that his name was Zerlot instead of Zerlot. And that was backed up when, um, after he showed up, there was another advertisement in the Fayetteville Observer in the Atlantic, which was out of New Bern, that said um, it had been changed with communications and that his name was actually Zerlot, not Carolot. And that was publicly uh, broadcast in the newspaper mm -hmm. to make that change. I know that he appeared at least one more time. So I know Zerlot did at least two sessions here. Um, he did the one when he came in June of 1854. And then again, in January of 1855, he did that following session. Taught the same courses, um, got the list here. It's, it's pretty cheap actually by today's standards. Music or on piano or guitar, 20 bucks. Uh, you can rent an instrument for five bucks for the semester. Modern language, each modern language was $10 and a drawing and a painting class. A drawing was $10, painting was $10 if you wanted them both. $20. <laughs> Do you know where and he lived? I do not. I know, have found nothing. Now, my guess is there's probably information out there, but I have not found it. So do you think his wife and son came with him? That's question number four. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, actually, I found nothing other than what I just told you. I find nothing about him. I can't find when he died, can't find cemeteries. You know, looked at headstones, RS, you know, grave sites, all that stuff. Search all the obit pages, search everything. I can't find anything. The only thing I can find. Um, in the 1870 census, there is an Eliza Zerlot, his wife, is listed as residing in uh, Ellicott City, Maryland. It had changed names in what, 1867? Something like that. It changed from Ellicott Mills to Ellicott City. Um, so it had hit Eliza Zerlot residing with other members of the Richard Zerlot family uh, in Ellicott City. I'm old, but it did, did not list him. It did not include him. So my guess is that he died in the 1860s. If he did not die in the 1860s, though, he definitely died by the 1870 census, because in the 1870 census, I find Eliza Zerlot again. This time she's residing with her son, Edmund, and she's identified as a widow. So... Um, whether she died in 18, he died in the 1860s or 1870s, I don't know. I did um, find that she died in 1898 in Owens Mill, so she lived considerably longer than him. So some of the remaining questions, that's all I found. Did he actually participate in the November uprising, you know, the Polo-Russian War? I don't know. Why did he choose Maryland? I mean, out of all the places on the Eastern Seaboard, he came into New York. Why did he choose Maryland? And then how did he get an audience with John Quincy Adams and all of those other folks? 
Uh, what became of his relationship with Frank Sear, who went on to become a professor at UVA? Um, they had had this school, they had to run across each other. All the, you know, one goes on and becomes a professor, the other is relegated to, you know, it's schools. They separated all of them. Yeah. Yeah. He's an itinerant, you know, why did he move to New Orleans? Why did he move to Kentucky or Ohio? Mm -hmm. You know, why did he make those moves? I talked to Betty before. We're assuming that he probably made those moves as made easier by the advent of radio, uh, no, <laughs> railroads. Mm -hmm. The introduction of the railroads probably made it easier to begin yeah. moving around like that. But why did he move? And how did he know that he would have something, or, you know, just moving around? How did he learn about Burwell School and why did he decide to teach there? Did he come by himself? Did he come with his family? You know, why? Uh, why did he leave the Burwell School? Where did he go? And what did he do during the Civil War? Mm -hmm. I mean, you got the whole 1850s. Do He's you know, here. Do you know anything more about her family Nothing. that would have helped? No. Or his family that was with the boy did? I, no. didn't, I didn't do a lot of research into his son, but no. But he didn't have any other members of his family that came over here with him. No. Not that I could find. Hmm. And then last, have when and where and how did he die? You know, the um, the Civil War thing is intriguing to me because if you think about the areas where he had been, Louisiana was strong Southern Confederate state. North Carolina was was a Confederate state, but kind of wishy-washy sometimes. And Kentucky's on the border. Kentucky's on the border. They okay. went both ways, although they stayed in the Union. Maryland was a Union state, although they had some Confederate sympathies. You know, so... You know, there's just so many up, and then Ohio, he was in Ohio, that was a strong union. So you know, state. He was a major at some point, they must have maybe tried to get him. Yes, but him. the point, yeah, the only thing I would think for him, though, was that when the Civil War started in 61, he was already 54 years old. Yeah. He was he was pretty long in the tooth okay. by standards, so, but by the end of the war, they were taking almost anything that would walk. Yeah. You know, but... They're just interesting questions. So that is all that I found. If anybody's got any questions, I can try to answer them, but kind of what you see is what you get at this point. Yes, ma'am. Do we know why his first classical school lasted only a year and a half? Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. I do not know that. Um, it was a question that I had, but I couldn't find anything. But as I found more and more um, about him, he didn't stay more than a year or two years anywhere. So, you know, the, the, the real pessimist in me saying, there's something wrong with this guy. <laughs> or or maybe maybe he just had that wanderlust that he just always wanted to, to get out and go. But, I mean, he stayed at that school for like a year, year and a half. He stayed at Burwell for a year. He stayed at the Kentucky um, school for two years. He stayed... He stayed at the Cincinnati School for Girls for two years. I mean, that seemed to kind of be his his upper limit uh, was a, was about two years. So, and uh, you said at one point he left his belongings. It was something about yeah, he had left some belongings. Makes you wonder. Yeah, they had some. They, <laughs> yeah, they had a package. They had yeah. a package for him in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, that he had 30 days to... Was that a so, girls' school? In no. Oh, in Louisville? Yeah, yeah that was a girls' school. Thanks for wondering. I don't know. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. It's hard for the cleanup batter to come when you've had such an outstanding guy on the base. Alrighty. My man, as I call him, uh, Rudolph Van Peel, V A M P I L L, I was a little kid when most of this happened. He was born in Breslau, uh, today we call it, in 1823. And by 1823, Zerlo had, you know, I mean, you know, he was a man. And this is where, this is Vienna, but it's close by. This is where he lived. So I, I thought of different ways to begin this, to try to get you all interested in sort of 
put back in the day. And I want you to imagine, here comes a young man to Hillsboro, and that's where he lived. <laughs> How long do you think he would last at Burwell School? Plus, he didn't go to the Presbyterian Church like the Burwells did. He was a free thinker. <laughs> Plus, he was a physician and a musician. Oh, and his job here was supposed to be to teach little 14 year old girls how to play the piano and speak foreign language. How long do you think he would last? Anybody want to suggest something? <laughs> one to two years. Probably one term. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, he lasted three months. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Rudolph Van Peel, um, I do know where he stayed in Hillsboro. If you go to the Presbyterian Church front door, on which is on the west side of the church, and you look toward the cemetery, over to the right, just about toe kicking distance from you, is a plot. And in that plot is a Revolutionary War hero named John Taylor and his daughter, Emma Taylor. And John Taylor, when he came back from the Revolutionary War, bought the corner lot down past the Colonial Inn at, across from the Baptist Church mm -hmm. at the corner of West King and uh, South, what is that, Wake Street? Mm -hmm. So that corner now has a little white house on it. But at the time, it had a big white house on it. And what John Taylor did to make money after the Revolutionary War was that he rented out rooms in that house. It was a big white house. And he got into debt the way everybody in Hillsboro did. And he was bailed out by Dr. Webb the way everybody in Hillsboro was. <laughs> and so when he died, he left that house to his daughter, Emma. And it had a thousand dollar debt to Dr. Webb, which is pretty much a lot of money then in 1849. And so uh, Emma uh, gave the lot to Dr. Webb for one dollar to settle the debt. And then the next year, she got married to a man from Granville County named, named uh, Robert Graves. And Robert Graves was a school teacher of math and physics at the uh, Caldwell Institute. And he had some money because his family owned farmland in Granville County. And so he paid back Dr. Uh, Webb the $1,000 and got the house back again. Mm -hmm. And so he and Emma lived there with their children, but they also rented rooms out. And because of his connection to the boys' schools in Hillsboro, they rented out rooms to boys. So when my man Van Peel came to Hillsboro, uh, Mrs. Burwell went down and talked to Emma Taylor and said, would you rent me a room for uh, Rudolph Van Peel? So that's where he lived. And that may be where Zilla lived too, because they did rent out rooms there before then. At the same time uh, in Hillsboro, there was the train came through and this train station in West Hillsboro, close to Hillsboro Barbecue. Mm -hmm. And there was a travelogue written in the Fayetteville newspaper about somebody that was taking the train from Fayetteville to Greensboro. And the train stopped in Hillsboro and it looked really pretty. So he got off the train <laughs> and he walked around town like a visitor. And he described what Hillsboro looked like and what the big houses were, and so on. And every big house in Hillsboro that you see today was on his list, on his travel log, mm -hmm. of, and he wrote down who lived there, and so on. And made his little, little going from the train station to King Street to out to uh, Airmount, back up here to the Burwell School, back to West Hillsboro, 
climbed the mountain, looked around just like you do today, came back down, walked back to uh, basically the library where the Nash Law Office was, and then back to the hotel and had his supper and then got on the train and left. Yes. So what year was that? 1855. Okay. And the only big house in Hillsborough that was not here then was the house across from the Episcopal Church where um, Cooper Harris lives now mm -hmm. and at the time was being built by Thomas Hill in a new modern tradition. Mm -hmm. That's why it looks different from all the rest of them. Because it's new and modern. Well, do you mean? Yeah. Italian it. Italian, anyway, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. So when uh, Down Peel came here to Hillsborough, it's pretty much like it is now in terms of if you took the historic tour. And this is where he was from. So let me see if I can get you from Vienna to Hillsboro and then tell you what happened. So he was born in 1823. Uh, he lived in the city. I don't know what his parents did for a living, but they were fairly well to do. He studied music and became a violinist as well as a pian pianist. And he studied medicine in Berlin, in Leipzig, and in Vienna. And then in 1848, born in 23, so he was how old? 25. 25 years old. He's in graduate school, medical school. And at the time, the students went to Weaver Street Market or Yonder or whatever it was in Vienna, <laughs> and they drank and talked. And the student got up and said, we need to be independent. We need for 12 things to happen, and he named these 12 things, of which I don't remember, but a few. Freedom of the press, freedom of speech, get rid of serfdom, have equal taxation for the wealthy, have independent elected Congress, have people of every group, Polish, German, Hungarian, representing in this Congress, went on and on, firebrand speech. And the kids, the young men, left this bar and went out into the streets and went to the law school and he made a speech at the law school. And then they left the law school and went to the medical school where our guy was and made the speech at the medical school. This was March 15th, 1848. Now a national holiday in Poland, I am told. Polish Independence Day. All these young men, educated, fairly well to do, decided this is enough, we're gonna take, do something right now. And so they formed an army called the Hungarian Dragoons. And they got as their general, a man named Joseph Bem, B-E-M, who had over the past 20 years or so, been trying to do something against the, what Napoleon had gone through, he'd come back to France, Russia had come down, Russia was there. The Habsburgs had been there. This was all, you know, all these monarchy, high-level people, and then these students. So they got them to be their leader, and they organized. And Rudolf Van Peel joined up as a captain. So they had battles, actual battles, from March until July. And he got wounded in one of these battles. And uh, the article I read said he was a lifelong cripple because of it. So the students prevailed and, and Ben prevailed and then he didn't start to prevail. And then the Habsburgs called the Russians and the Russians came in and crushed the revolution three months. Which is about how long he stayed at the Berlin School. <laughs> so, he and the other people 
that were the students, the intellectuals, the fairly wealthy science of their families were given three choices. We'll kill you, we'll put you in prison for life, or you can take this ticket on this sailboat and go to America. <laughs> so Rudolph Van Peel said, I'll take the ticket. Now, how he got from Vienna to America, I have not been able to find. And part of that is because the information is not available. And part of that is because my eyesight is so bad, I can't read the information. But he told a friend of his later on that he came by way of Cuba. So I think what he did was to go from Germany to Cuba, which took about uh, 10 days to two weeks on a sailing ship in those days. And then from Cuba, he came to the United States. But I don't have a record of him doing that. Mm. The first record I have is he's in Fayetteville. Mm. And I think he got to Fayetteville by train. And I think probably what happened was that he came into Savannah or Charleston mm -hmm. and then came on up to Fayetteville. But in Fayetteville, he set himself up to make money by establishing an orchestra and giving piano lessons and violin lessons. And from Fayetteville, somehow, he came to the Burwell School. Now, this was right after Zerlo had been here. And Mrs. Burwell's diary says that Zerlo had gotten sick in the spring and had not been able to teach his lessons in the spring semester very well. But the students did give a concert, which she said they did a pretty good job at. And Zerlo then was leaving. I don't know why, but apparently they'd been sick. And so they, they somehow got from Fayetteville, this young man who also was university educated, also could teach foreign language, also uh, could teach music, was exactly who they needed. And if they had liked Zerlo, they probably said, oh good, he'll be like Zerlo. Mm -hmm. But anyway, they hired him. He was in his 20s. He, uh, well, his 30s by then. And uh, he came in, and one of the first things he did after he moved into Mr. Graves' establishment was walk up here with his violin and give a concert after supper. So everybody had supper together at the Burwell School, and he gave his concert. <laughs> then he had his girls to give a concert. And in Mrs. Burwell's diary, she says the concert was tolerable. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next thing we have in the diary was that Mrs. Burwell went to Mr. Gray's establishment and visited Mr. Van Peel to see how he was doing and everything seemed to be okay. But then the next thing that we have in the diary is that some girls at night when Mrs. Burwell came around to check on how everybody was doing, complained that Mr. Van Peel had spoken improperly to some of the girls. Mm -hmm. Now you can use your imagination. He's in his 30s. He's had this life. Mm -hmm. The girls are at 14. Did he say to them, you've got a concert coming up, and if you don't practice more than you have been practicing, it's going to be a pretty shitty concert. <laughs> Did he say to them, when your parents come to pick you up in November for Thanksgiving vacation, they want to hear you play, and it better be a lot better than this last concert? Or did he say, slide over on that piano bench, honey, and let me sit next to you. <laughs> or did he say, I want you to sit up straight when you play the piano. Make your bosom into a lighthouse. I mean, we don't know who he said. <laughs> but whatever he said, the girls thought it was 
improper. <laughs> and they told Mrs. Burwell. Mm -hmm. And Mrs. Burwell told Reverend Mr. Burwell. Mm -hmm. And Reverend Mr. Burwell thought about it overnight. And the next day, he, after dinner, the next evening, told Mr. Van Peel he wanted to see him a minute and told him his services were no longer needed. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine Mr. Van Peel walking back to Mr. Graves, saying, I just got fired, Ticket, taking all this stuff, walking out to West Hillsboro, getting on the train, and leaving. Mm -hmm. So that's what we know about that. <laughs> you know where you came? Oh, there's more. I do know where you <laughs> So he went to Tarboro, which is an unusual place to go because it's not a train in Tarboro. So he must have gone from Hillsboro to Fayetteville, Goldsboro, to Rocky Mount, and then either walked or took a tram or something to Tarboro. And in Tarboro, he advertised himself as being a doctor. Mm -hmm. And he set up medical practice for just a little while. But he didn't seem to be well received there. So he decided, or somebody told him, or whatever, that he should get a U.S. medical license, mm -hmm. not this fake German Vienna mm -hmm. stuff. So he went to Baltimore, to the University of Baltimore, and he got a medical degree from the University of Baltimore Medical School. So he was set. Then he uh, went to South Carolina. Why? I don't know. I, in, in, the, in, the, in the research, <laughs> no, you didn't want to go back to Tarboro. In the research I did, it seemed that Baltimore was a center for German and Polish mm -hmm. immigrants mm -hmm. at the time, just as Zerlo was there. Mm -hmm. And it may be in Baltimore, he communicated with people who said, you should go to South Carolina, because they need doctors in South Carolina. I don't know why, but he went to South Carolina, and he met a young woman that he fell in love with, and they got married. I love this, in Dillon, South Carolina. Oh. You only now, had to be 16. Yeah. <laughs> so they're married and living there in, in South Carolina. Her name was Anna Jane Hargroves, and his, her parents were fairly wealthy farmers. They owned thousands of acres of land. And uh, he, uh, this is just before the Civil War, 1860. He went to a place that now is Mullins, South Carolina, and he bought a thousand acres of land. And he and her name was Anna Jane, but he called it Jane. He and Jane set up a farm. And what do you suppose this young man knew how to grow? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Right. But what did this young man enjoy doing? Drinking wine. So he planted 600 acres of vineyards. He had 25 different varieties of grapes. And the area of Mullins is on the railroad. He shipped grapes to New York City and he made wine and shipped wine to New York City and made some money. And all during the Civil War, he was making money in Mullins, South Carolina. And one article about him called him carpetbagger, which mm -hmm. if you grew up in the South, you know, it's a terrible word. But it means somebody who ain't from around here who came and bought up stuff and made money on it. Mm -hmm. So that's what he did. Mm -hmm. But they loved him. He was very personable. He set up a store. He ran the grocery store in Mullins, South Carolina. He was postmaster of Mullins, South Carolina. And in 1872, when South Carolina decided Mullins could be an incorporated city, he became the manager, they called it the intendant, of the town of Mullins, South Carolina, 
He surveyed the streets. They had four streets, two north, south, two east, west. There was a river. He built himself a warehouse that was 100 feet long and 60 feet wide on the river. And boats could come up into the warehouse and he could download his wine into the boats, which they could then ship to New York City, not just on the railroad, but also that way. And he had a little bateau, pleasure boats. And I don't know if you've ever been to, to Disney in uh, Orlando, into this little building you go into where where they play it's a small world <laughs> and you sit on boats yeah i was stuck in there for a yeah. and what you know, paddle around is that kind of place where you could have fun and he built a six acre park like he was used to parks in the big cities in europe and like central park where he had koi ponds and little hills and swings and chairs for people to sit in, and gardens. And it was just a lovely, lovely area. He was trying to bring so Europe to Mullins, South Carolina. So did he practice medicine? And he practiced medicine. Oh my goodness. Okay. So and keep going. he and his wife had a little girl named Otilia, and she could swing on the swings in the park. So all this was going fine for him. And the uh, Marion County uh, government paid attention to what was going on. And they said, so, uh, Dr. Van Peel, how would you like to be the tax collector for the county and for the town of Mullins? And he says, sure, I'll do that. But for some reason, unfortunately, that year, the tax records burned. And nobody could tell how much taxes anybody owed. <laughs> and the county thought, well, you should get about $8,000 from these people. And he said, well, I don't know. There's no records. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, we don't think you did anything wrong, Dr. Van Peel, but uh, you, we don't want you to be tax collector <laughs> anymore. And so you're out of that job. And finances being what they were, he said, that's OK. I'll go to Columbia and get a job in Columbia, South Carolina. So he did, and he got a job at the University of South Carolina teaching music. Because <laughs> he loved music, played violin, yeah. And he was there for several years at the University of South Carolina teaching music. And his wife, who now had a chance to be in the big city of Columbia, uh, said, you know what I would really like to do? And he said, what? And Jan said, I would like to be a doctor too. Wouldn't it be great if we could have a practice together? And he said, sure, that's all right with me. And she said, well, I read in the newspaper that there are a lot of women doctors in America now, and they study at the University of Philadelphia Medical School. Can we go to Philadelphia? And you do whatever you do, and you can take care of Otelia while I go to medical school. And he says, sure, honey, that sounds great to me. And so they did. And she went to medical school at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, uh, now called Drexel University. And she got her medical degree. And she wrote her, I love this, she wrote her thesis on childhood group and they've got it but i couldn't read it because my eyesight is not that good it's in a little bit of handwriting on brown piece of paper but it's there if you want to look it up so after she got her medical degree and they had been in the city of philadelphia did they go back to mullins south carolina no they did not eventually they did not at first. Instead, they did the same thing that Zerlo did. They went to Springfield, Ohio. Mm -hmm. Now, when I was in high school, when Bill was worried about wearing polyester pants, <laughs> I had, and this was much earlier than Bill, because I'm older than he is by a couple of decades. But anyway, <laughs> I, I had coaches for European history and coaches for US history. 
And so during football season, we didn't learn a lot. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I did sort of remember that there was such a thing called the National Road, also called Cumberland Road. That was the first interstate highway built by the federal government. And it was built from Baltimore to along the Potomac River to the Ohio River in Springfield, Ohio. Mm -hmm. And it was the road that many German Polish immigrants used to cross the Midwest. And when they got to Springfield, Ohio, these eight men decided that they wanted to be American Americans, not German Americans. So they split from the Lutheran church, which taught its lessons and preached its preachings in German to this other Lutheran church that they set up that was in English, same thing, but in English. And they formed a university called Wittenberg University based on Martin Luther in Springfield, Ohio, population 2,600. And the first class had eight people in it. But I think our man knew about that university because he said to his wife, let's go to Springfield, Ohio. And they went either by on the Cumberland Road or I think they went on a railroad that you are very familiar with if you ever played the game of Mon Monopoly. They went on the B&O. You know, that's one of the trains on the Monopoly. The Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. I think that's what they did. They got to Springfield. They could either be doctors together, which they wanted to be, or they could teach music. Mm -hmm. And they had little Otelia with them. And they were such a cute couple with their little girl that they would be a big hit. And they stayed in Springfield for a little while. But I really think it was a little bit too small for him. Because, I mean, you know. Did he sell off his vineyard? No. So he still had income. They still land. have they still have the land in Mullins. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Who was managing it for him? I don't know. She had a big family. Mm -hmm. So it could have been some of her family. So they were in Springfield, Ohio for two years. And they decided maybe this wasn't where they wanted to be. So they moved to LaPorte, Indiana. And I talked to a man who runs a museum, a historical museum in LaPorte. And he looked around, he said, there's nothing here about any damn peels. But there is a note that a German couple came through and offered to give music lessons in 1878. So maybe that was them, I don't know. Then they left there and they went to Cincinnati. Now Cincinnati was big and had a big German population. And they thought, okay, we'll have our medical practice in Cincinnati. And my theory is, and then it snowed. Because <laughs> I think Jan said, look, we're not going to stay here. We're going back to South Carolina. Mm -hmm. So two years later after that, in 1880, they went back to Marion County, South Carolina, to the vineyard, to the thousands of acres, and so on. Mm -hmm. But Van Peel wasn't interested in that anymore. One of the things that he had done while he was a farmer in uh, Marion County was he invented things. And one of the things he invented was rototilla. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he invented was for a train, it was called the Railroad Jack. And what it was, if a train went off the track, you could jack it up on this railroad jack mm -hmm. and put it back on the track again. Mm -hmm. For which he got patents for both of those things. And while he was out in Ohio, Scientific American published an article about his patents. Oh, it was a big deal. So this is a man who's not really satisfied sitting in Mullen, South Carolina, growing <laughs> grapes. So in 1881, he puts an ad in the Charlotte Observer saying, he is going to open a joint medical practice in Charlotte with his wife. Well, that never happened as far as I know. Mm -hmm. But in 1882, he and his wife 
left Mullins with their daughter and went to Lumberton, North Carolina, which is on the railroad, <laughs> got rooms in the hotel and set up a medical practice. And they loved it there. And the people in Lumberton loved them. And they lived there the rest of their lives. So they built a house, which was a great big Victorian type house with a turret that went up three stories. They met the community. Their daughter, who was a teenager, fell in love. She married a man named William Carlisle from Lumberton, whose family owned half of Lumberton. And they had their medical practice, and everything was going great. But then, Otelia, their daughter, and William, who were living in the same house with them, this great big Victorian house, started having grandchildren. Well, after the third grandchild, <laughs> Rudolph said to Jane, you know, I don't really like being here so much anymore. Uh, how about if we go to Florida? <laughs> this is railroad, right? So they get on the train in Wilmerton. They go to Florida, get off in Jacksonville, and he gets a job teaching violin at the university in Jacksonville. And they stay in Jacksonville from 1889 to 1890. And then in 1891, she said, well, what about medical practice? I want to I get back to being medical practice. And he said, okay. So in 1891, they left Jacksonville and they moved to Savannah. And they set up a joint medical practice in Savannah. And it must be that the authorities said, okay, she's got a degree from Philadelphia and she grew up in South Carolina. You have a degree from Baltimore. Where did you grow up? You got any naturalization papers? Well, he didn't. So he had to go in Savannah in 1895 down to the fort and get himself naturalization papers. So if you were just sort of, you know, la la, I'm looking up Van Peel, when did he come to America? It looks like he came in 1895, <laughs> but that's not true. That's just when the paperwork was done. So they stayed in Savannah for a few years. And then in 1893, Otelia said, Mama, I wish you would really come back to Lumberton I've got these uh, four children now, and it would be really nice if you could help me out. And so Mama said, okay, we'll do that. So they went back to Lumberton, and Van Peel said, I cannot stand it with all these children. I'm going to buy this house across the street and renovate it into an opera house. <laughs> and so he did. And he gutted the building except for one apartment, which was his apartment where he had an office and he could live in there all by himself if he wanted to. And the rest of it was this huge building that had a blue ceiling, golden stars painted on the ceiling, and a stage with curtains and seats. There were just chairs like these for 500 people. Wow. And it was right on the railroad, and people coming from New York to Florida, Florida to New York, could stop in Lumberton, the scenic city, and go to the performances. It would be like having Deepak in the city. <laughs> and I know all of this because there was a man at UNC who did his PhD on the Opera House. And his question was, could Lumbee Indians go to the Opera House? And the answer was, yeah. no, they couldn't. But this is what the Opera House was like. So he had all this information. So is the Opera House still there? The house that they moved from? Those houses, are they still in Lumberton? They were up until about the 1950s. And then Lumberton decided to do a um, renovation. renovation. Um, so they're not there anymore. But there are pictures. Is there a mm -hmm. So uh, he he had acts that came from all over. He had a regular act of the orphans at Oxford Orphanage course, 
would come down to Lumberton and sing at the Opera House. Mm -hmm. And he had people that come by train from Virginia and Maryland, wherever, and play music at the Opera House. But it was, it was a big deal. And then when movies came along, he set up a movie projector Ooh. and he showed movies oh. at the Opera House. This is, this is, you know, up and coming. And he, at last, in all these years, was happy. And then his wife died. Aww. And his daughter and son-in-law kept having more children. And so he moved over into his room in the opera house and said, you guys take the house, and the, the big house, and I'm going to live over here. And he lived over there um, for another four years. And in 1907, he died, and the night before he died, the neighbors reported they could hear him playing his violin in his room mm -hmm. in the hour. Mm -hmm. And then his daughter had two more children. <laughs> and she decided when the oldest one was a teenager that she was going to go to Mullins, South Carolina and show them where she grew up, where she used to live. And so I found a wonderful, wonderful interview with her in the Mullen, South Carolina newspaper, telling all of this stuff. And then the grandchildren grew up, and there are two of them in NCpedia, which is the Eastern North Carolina Wikipedia encyclopedia, whatever. And one of them was a young woman who never married who became a very well-known uh, missionary. And the other one was a congressman that represented Eastern North Carolina. So, Van Peel only lasted here three months, <laughs> but he did a lot of stuff. Yeah. How many children were there at all? Seven. Grandchildren. Seven grandchildren. And then there's a whole parcel of great-grandchildren. And like, Bill, I tried to contact them, and uh, I sort of gave up because they were not responding to me. But also, I'm sort of glad they didn't contact me back, because what did I say? Uh, I'm going to talk about your granddaddy that got fired at the <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, Thank you so much. This was just thoroughly enjoyable. Yeah. Who says that storytelling is passe and is gone forever? Oh, wow. I mean, y'all are doing that. Yeah. Um, and we invite you to stay for refreshments. Please help yourself to some refreshments. But before we break for refreshments, I would like to tell you some exciting news we learned a few days ago. We learned the Burwell School Historic Site has been awarded the IMLS Inspire Grant for small museums for continuation of the comic book project, uh, which, and behind in the uh, table uh, back of you, uh, there is a couple of uh, comic books. We have written two comic books, and these are based on. Uh, Orange County people who have been an inspiration. The comic books are targeted toward fifth graders. Um, and we're hoping the sort of the theme is they did it, you can too. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we're real excited. The grant will give us the opportunity to write four more comic books. And uh, so we're excited about that. And the comics will fulfill part of the Burwell's mission, which is to celebrate and promote the culture and heritage of Hillsboro and Orange County. And Emma Badney, who is a site manager at Burwell, and our own Betty uh, will oversee the grants management. So anyhow, we're excited about that. So please have your <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.